Hi, I'm Mary Greendale and welcome to Just Thinking. Tonight, we're thinking about racism. I wanted to do a show on race in Holliston. In my typical fashion, I uh, immediately came up with a plan, sent that out to a lot of different people to get their feedback and boom, I got feedback that made me realize that I didn't know how to talk about race, not in a productive way anyway. I can talk about it from personal experience and from my own opinions, but how will that work? I didn't want to argue. I wanted to learn. I wasn't even sure I knew what the word racism means. We do know race is an emotional and really personal topic. Uh, it has hundreds of years of history simmering underneath it, but how do we talk about it? So then I remembered that the Congregational Church has a diversity group and it's been meeting for a few years and i thought well maybe they've had some experiences they can share what have they learned so today we will find out i have invited three women from that group to talk about their experiences before we start we want to be we all have agreed on the fact that there had to be a few caveats with this we are not promoting religious solutions or any religion in particular or any religion in general this group is a church-based group but i am part of a book group where I would feel safe enough to have a conversation about race as well. In fact, we have. The real issue is that whatever you, whatever group is having a conversation, there have to be certain understandings among you, and you've got to feel safe enough to share your experiences and be candid and honest without being hurtful. And you also have to be able to be willing to look inside yourself and not just wonder if it's the other person. So let me apologize up front if we don't get this perfect. Uh, we're not experts. We're not providing you a checklist that you can run through and say, well, I learned how to do that. We're just exploring. And what these three women have learned about talking about race, I hope I can glean some information I can find useful, and that's what I hope will happen for you as well. So my three guests are Don Derning Hammond, and there's, uh, I'm sure if people have heard of Don, Don's been around for a while, Nicole Simpson, and Allison Lima, and I remember Allison from doing the um, the bridge, the eight arch bridge. She was on the construction committee. So, John, can you please begin and briefly introduce yourself, and then I'll have each of the other ladies speak. Yeah, sure. I'm Dawn Derning Hammond. I've lived in Mudville since 1991. Uh, my husband and I raised our two children here in Holliston, and uh, in my work life, I work for the Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ. So that's the organization that supports the 600 or so congregational churches in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. And I do uh, financial and policy work mostly with that nonprofit. Great. All right, Nicole Simpson. Hi, uh, I'm Nicole Simpson. I live in Hopkinton, so I'm right next door. But I've been attending the First Congregational Church of Holliston for several years. And um, I've been participating in uh, this anti-racism group for about three years. Um, I have a toddler at home and for work, I'm an engineering manager for a medical device company. Cool. And Allison Lima. Hi, my name is Allison Lima. I've lived in town about 10 years. I'm married with three kids. My kids are in middle school and high school, so they're a little bit older than Nicole's kids. I, for work, I'm an engineering manager as well as Nicole. Um, although I work um, on bridge construction, building construction, that sort of thing. Um, and the only thing that I would note just relative um, to this discussion as we launch forward is, you know, I didn't grow up here. Um, I grew up in a town pretty similar to Holliston, um, perhaps whiter than Holliston. And so that's sort of a nugget um, that I'm sure will get woven into to things that we talk about here. Thanks. Okay, that's, that's great. All right, so we're going to start with the definition of racism and what is it? And I think, Nicole, um, you're going to start us off, are you? Sure. Yeah, so there's many definitions of racism, but the one that within our group we used is uh, defined by the Black leadership of uh, the United Church of Christ. Um, so it's a long definition, but here are three of the main points that come from it. Racism is racial prejudice combined with power. It is the intentional or unintentional use of power to isolate, separate, and exploit others based on race. 
both consciously and unconsciously, racism is enforced and maintained by the institutions of our society. For example, our legal systems, schools, banks, religious organizations, and businesses. And within our group, we've spent a little bit of time digging into this definition. So, you know, some of the key things we've talked about is how it's that combination of power that makes racism. Um, it's not just about the intentional acts, but it's also those unintentional microaggressions. And then lastly, something that really important that sometimes gets lost in conversations about racism is it's not just about these over interpersonal um, acts of racism, but it's the systems, um, the systems in our country that um, enable and perpetuate um, racism uh, to, to take place in, in the US. So we're talking about the systems in that definition, you're talking about the systems within the banking community, the educational system, and all of those other things that were itemized within there. Okay, and so that, that definition was done by the black leadership of the entire UCC of the United Church, no, our church? No, I'll speak to that. <laughs> it's actually a group of people who are working in Connecticut, in the Connecticut Conference of the United Church of Christ on Racism, uh, and they were developing a curriculum, and we were interested in that definition based on the fact that our, our sister church people had come up, with, come up with it through their curriculum. No, we cannot claim that the entire United Church of Christ black leadership came up with this. Okay. Um, it's, it's helpful. We particularly like the intentional or unintentional, aware or unaware. I mean, it's it's racism is all of those things. So, yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Didn't mean to interrupt, but I I knew the oh, answer. Yeah, that's, good. that's fine. That's good fine. Advice. Um. So let's start with the definition. We were we did the definition. Beyond that, let's talk about how your racial justice group started. I mean, what was the genesis? And I don't know who wants who wants to take that one, but. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, okay. So Dawn, Dawn is one of the people um, that, that got this going, but um, at our church it started in 2017 and it's, it essentially started as a book group. And so we had a book that we would all read and we would come together and discuss about the book. Um, you know, since that first inception, it's, it's really sort of ebbed and flowed into different things. Um, we listen to TED Talks, we share articles, we email, we, you know, just get together and, and talk. Um, the group itself, um, you know, similar to Holliston is predominantly white. We do certainly have people of color that are involved. Um, and the other thing that's been really interesting is because we're all connected through church, um, we all know each other and we have this sense of trust with each other. So we're able to be vulnerable or ask those questions that, you know, maybe some people don't, don't know how to say out loud. Um, there's a safe space, um, which is really nice. And, you know, we have you know, somebody who grew up in the South. We have somebody who, um, you know, when she was younger, fell in love with um, a person of color and dealing with these interracial issues. So really the group itself comes at at this discussion from completely different different perspectives you know some people for their work they're you know active um, in terms of racial just racial justice where some of them like some people like myself it's just something that we've come into because they want to learn more about it so the when you when you talk about you have a couple of people a few people in in the group that are a people of color and so mm -hmm. forth has there been any discomfort having this conversation? Is there any difference um, how you feel about having the conversation with them in the room or not in the room? It's all just... Uh, you know, speaking for me, um, no. <laughs> and, it, and it's so valuable. Um, it's so valuable to have people really of all backgrounds that, um, that you can talk and you can ask questions. And, and there's been things that I've said um, that that people of color have, have chimed in and said, you know, you know, I heard what you said and I understand why you said what you said, but this is my perspective on what you said. Um, and because we all know each other, right? And we have this circle of trust together. Um, it, it's not really, you know, there's nothing adversarial about it. There's nothing that, you know, I bite my tongue and I don't say, um, that's not what the group is about. You know, it's about, learning together, growing together, that sort of thing. It presents an interesting problem, though, for a group 
that perhaps of random people. I mean, I can't imagine just taking three people off the street or just inviting three people who want to discuss the subject of racism to come in here and let's talk. Um, I'm assuming that there had to be a whole lot of conversations that went on before the let's talk kind of thing happened. So um, what, are, you know, what was that kind of process or conversation like? Well, Dawn can certainly speak to our process because she's been really deliberate about keeping us on track and, and making sure it's a balanced group. So Dawn, can I pass it off to you? Yeah, sure. I also wanted to say, um, you know, I co-lead the group and my co-leader is a woman of color. And I, I want to say that we, we did that very intentionally. We don't want to have a racism group that's mostly white people and all led by white people. It just doesn't make sense if we can avoid it. I mean, it's okay if you have a group to talk about racism and it's all white people, that's okay, but it's a different thing. If you're going to have a couple people of color in the group, then you need some leadership of color as well. So um, so I just wanted to make that clear because I'm very aware that, you know, we're white people sitting here tonight. You're talking about it. Yeah. And we want to, we want to make it really clear that we are not experts. We are really learners. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we, um, you know, we decided to do this because we think it's important that white people get out and talk about racism instead of like hiding out. But I just wanted to acknowledge that we're very aware that we're three white women talking this evening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> At four, yes. <laughs> yes, as a panel plus our plus our interviewer um, and host. Um, so yeah, so as Ali said, we had a big leg up in terms of process by being a church group. Um, actually, there were people in the group that I didn't know well to start out with, but we all started from a perspective. We're in a context where we've kind of agreed to care about one another, right? Where we've agreed that compassion is part of what we do. Um, so that really helps. Um, Mary, you described your book group. My guess is you developed some of the same kind yeah. of assumption yeah. there. Um, and, but then we have a lot of deliberate tools that are not at all unique to us. Um, I think they're very common in terms of having difficult conversations. They're commonly used for difficult conversations. So like listening well is a really major thing that we try to do, right? Listening to one another without, you know, with interest and without interrupting and without arguing. Um, and uh, we do a lot of taking turns speaking so that everybody gets a chance and nobody goes on for too long and no one is shut out of the conversation. Um, we try really hard to speak from our own experience and our own, with our utter own perspectives, um, you know, about our own thoughts and feelings. Uh, and that, what that means is that things like debate and argument don't really enter in, you know, like, if Nicole's telling that her life experience, there's really nothing to argue with. I, my, I get to listen and then I get to say about my life experience. So, um, so that's been really helpful. Um, you know, and as a religious group, we open and close with prayer, which is just our version of kind of grounding ourselves in the big picture um, of our values and, and, um, and the things that we find important. So, um, so those are, again, common tools for people who work um, in, in mediation or in conflict resolution or whatever, but they've been very helpful in, you know, because racism is a really fraught topic. Every we, you know, I, I have many feelings about racism. My observation is that other people do too, and uh, it's a, you know, it's a difficult, difficult topic. And so, uh, so those tools are helpful. I know when I sent out my email that was this what I thought thoughtfully prepared plan of, haha. -ha. I'm going to launch this community-wide discussion on race. Look at us. <laughs> Won't this be great? I was surprised at um, the kinds of responses that I got. Not everybody's amenable to even really having the conversation. That one kind of shocked me. That was, you know, the, oh. Yeah. I think oh, wow. their sentiment seemed to be, I think we're hearing enough about it. It's on the news every night. I don't need to have it, you know, in my face at home. We don't need to do that here. Um, then there was the, well, who are we to be talking about this? Because what right do we have? What do we know? And, um, you know, that, and trying to explain that that was precisely the problem uh, kind of didn't work uh, mm -hmm. of, well, I want to know. Well, then fine, you go ahead and <laughs> explore. But, you know, trying to get a townwide conversation. So it's, and then of course, with a couple of people anyway, it ended up being a politically charged conversation. So, um, and, and that's not going to be helpful for anybody. So that's when I sort of backpedaled and said, all right, how do you, how do you start at the basics? So 
if again you when you're starting off then and you establish that okay the little ground rules that we have is we're not going to interrupt one another or or whatever what happens with body language what happens with the eye rolling and that kind of thing if somebody does something do you call each other out on it just really oh. curious about how one handles that kind of sensitive thing I can't remember a single eye roll. Can any of you? I mean, I think we have a very strong group norm of caring for one another and listening to one another. Um, so I realize that's very special. Um, I wanted to thank you, Mary, for persisting in the face of all those. Because you <laughs> run into the way people, with all the difficult feelings people have about racism. Like, yeah. please don't want to think about that, which I have to say, let me point out that that's something that is way easier for white people to do, right? We sort of have the option yeah. of thinking about racism, whereas um, our neighbors of color pretty much don't. Um, but, uh, but no, I, um, that, that, that overt dismissiveness, I have not ever noticed. I don't know if either of you have, um, Ali or Nicole. No, and, and I would say to, to sort of follow up on Dawn's earlier point, um, because we're sharing each other's, you know, our own stories, right? If, if I said something that Dawn thought was alarming, right, Dawn's not going to roll her eyes. She's mm. going to ask me, oh, could you explain a little bit more about that time that blah, 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 because, you know, and she'll help reframe it. And so the, the eye rolls don't, don't happen because it, it's, it's, there's nothing adversarial. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, you know, clueless white people in the group that, like me, right? <laughs> I'll put myself, right? We're all growing and there's no judgment, no judgment. Yeah, in fact, we all know that we're a mess on this topic <laughs> in some way, right? So we're there in a very confessional way, like, wow, do I need to learn about this? I am clueless because, you know, for the most part, we are. Um, and so, so we begin with that understanding, which is a very, you know, forgiving and, and I think necessary place to begin. You know, it, it's that defensiveness is going to get us nowhere in this conversation. So I'm sorry, I, I jumped in again. Nicole, did no, you have okay. a thought about that? <laughs> the only thing I was going to say is um, there's a, a, an appreciation within the group that everyone is coming from a different place in their journey of understanding racism and, and um, being anti-racist. So um, with that respect, it, it's just, um, you know, somebody might say something that maybe at, at your own stage of, of understanding racism you wouldn't say, um, but it's, but it's not where anybody gets called out or, you know, it's just, we're all, we're all growing and, and when correction is needed for a statement, it's, it's done with, with love and um, respect for each other. Do you find that having uh, different ages in the group makes it harder to have these conversations? Do older people respond differently than younger people? Is there more flexibility? That just occurred to me. I, it, it was like looking at your, looking at the gallery. I mean, we've got, you know, we're talking different generations here uh, from, from Nicole to me. Um, and, and so it's like, wow, you know, I think that's impressive. I think it's impressive that, that there is a cross section of ages because I, I, but I just wondered, have you had any, that's just off the top of my head. Does it, Dawn, do you think it's ever made any difference? Well, the group skews older. I mean, we picked a, a bunch of us that are, Bonnie picked a bunch of us that are different ages. I would say the biggest effect it's had is, so Ali mentioned we started out as a book group, but we quickly got off being a book group because there were so many moms with school age or younger children in the group who just did not have time, working moms, who did not have time to read a whole book. So they're like, oh, please don't make me read another book. I'm having a time. I really want to be a part of the group, but I can't read a book. And that's why we started watching TED Talks. So that's been the most concrete. Um, yeah. But I don't know. Uh, you guys might have more to say about, you know, um, uh, the effect of having, uh, an, you know, we have a bunch of women, in, you know, my age in our 60s and maybe older. Um, and I don't know to what extent that, you know, makes it, does or doesn't make it harder for you as younger women. No, I, I think it's actually really valuable to have this intergenerational cross-section of, of people because everybody comes from such a unique place, right? Sometimes it's based on where they grew up. Other time it's, you know, the decade they grew up. It, it, so it, it makes the whole discussion much more rich because you can appreciate 
you know, the, the, the vast difference in the personal story of the more senior women um, and the younger women. So I, I, I think it's an asset. Yeah, I, I guess I, I can see that it could be. I, I just wondered whether it would be relevant. You know, sometimes uh, as as one ages, sometimes you run across um, a situation where you become a little more invisible, um, where people are, uh, younger people are less likely to listen to you or they glaze over a little bit <laughs> or whatever. Uh, and I'm not unsympathetic, but um, I just wondered if perhaps it didn't seem relevant to those of you who were um, significantly younger, you know, it's been, I've got grandchildren that are older than your young baby or your little toddler. So, you know, at any rate, all right. So has participating in this group changed you? And if so, how, and do you think or behave differently than you did before you started? So where does that one go? Well, I think we're, uh, we're going to model what we do, and we're going to each take turns with that one, and we're going to make some relatively concise turns. Nicole, do you want to start, since Allie and I have been yakking away? <laughs> sure, I can start. Yeah, I think a, a, the biggest difference for me is that I now have the language to discuss racism that I never really had before. Um, so it's uncomfortable to think and talk about racial injustice, and especially if, like me, you haven't been doing it your whole life. Um, it takes a lot of practice and introspection and learning and unlearning to remove implicit biases. Um, and so I've also learned that you can't fix what uh, you don't see. And so um, a colorblind philosophy is really common and it's well-intentioned, but it it's problematic because it's it's not reality um, for one thing. We all see race and ethnicity and that's not a bad thing. Um, and, and two, it also denies the experiences of people of color. So by just saying that we're all the same, it ignores the realities that of the world that we live in. Um, so I now have a better understanding of many of the systems in the US that perpetuate inequality between white people and people of color, particularly black and indigenous people of color. Um, for example, redlining and um, the inequality of the GI Bill after World War II. Those were things I knew nothing about, but from this group, I've, I've learned more about them. And knowing that history is really powerful for understanding things like racial wealth gap. And um, like many white people, uh, when I've heard about elements of systemic racism for the first time, my initial gut feeling is sometimes like, how is this true? I, how could I not have known about this? Or well, that's not fair. I worked really hard for what I have, but you know, I, I've sat with that discomfort and, and have been working through that. And you know, I can know at the same time, well, yes, I did work hard for things, but also the color of my skin never worked against me. And um, in many cases, that's helped me. And once I had that framework for thinking, uh, it's opened up my view of the world and, and made me see the world very differently. That's a very thoughtful response. Thank you. Um, when you say the language of talking about this subject, can you give me an example of what you mean? And anybody can chime in if you have a thought, but Nicole, if you can. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think um, something, you know, I said it with the definition, but also, you know, I'll probably say it more that the, you know, talking about systems versus the acts of racism um that that's something you know it's very easy you know we we've all probably said it well i'm not racist you know and it's not about uh you, like i i don't think any of us have ever intentionally done you know something that it was done or said something that's racist but it it um it's so embedded within um, society and culture and and some things that we say may unintentionally be leading to racism or it's the systems in place so having an understanding of that um, and doing the homework to, to understand that um, and also practicing having these conversations and even um, how do you refer to people different than you we've been using the term people of color a lot but people of color is also a broad term and when you're specifically talking about um, Black people or Indigenous people, saying what you mean um, is productive for 
for the conversation because not all experiences and, and races, um, not all races have had the same experiences. Um, I did bump into that in this process myself when I started. I've been interviewing people who, um, in the, for the most part, young people or and, and whatever that went through the school system here. Some of them a very long time ago. All right. And so, but then I discovered like today, it's not that we have a lot of black people in terms of African American black people in the school system, but we do have a lot more people of color in our school system now than we ever have in my history here. And that's over 50 years. So that made me think, yeah, but if I'm talking about someone who's come here from Pakistan, that under that has to be completely different from somebody who grew up in a an African background that developed from a slave cult, you know, literally started with a slavery here. So I said, oh, well, what do you do with this? Frankly, what I found is if I just ask them as gently as I can, you know, uh, how would you compare your experience with what you think you understand about? Um, yeah, that was a that was an eye opener to me. That, that is absolutely sure. We we do tend to try to cluster people so that we or we we got to label everything. You know, it's just that everything's got to have a tag to it, and you got to be able to tuck everybody into a box. And I think that's you know the term people of color is helpful in that it does say non-white, but it's I don't know, it's not quite there yet. We need another another one. Okay, so uh, Allison, how about you? What it what did you uh, what's your, uh, you know, what have you learned about yourself? Yeah, what yeah. have you about yourself more than anything, I guess? Yeah, I'd, I'd say for me, um, I was interested in joining the group um, because I was really disturbed by all the overt hate happening. Um, Here? You know, well, just in general, you oh, okay. know, um, anti-Semitism, you know, bombing, shooting, like, it's like all of, all of a sudden, you know, your, your news feed erupts with all these stories about hate. And, um, you know, as a, as a mom of, of three teenagers, it, it really disturbed me. And, um, and, and I'm constantly kind of um, trying to reconcile how, how can, how can I move the discussion forward? How, how can I make a difference? How can their world look different than my newsfeed? Um, and so I, when I found, you know, this group, I was really called to like, I don't know, start an anti-hate group and, and like, you know, make buttons with my kids and, and like do something and fix the problem. And I think for me, the biggest takeaway is, um, slow down, white savior, trying to fix everybody, right? Yeah. And just listen and just learn and, and come to terms with all the stuff you don't know. Um, you know, it's interesting, Nicole brought up the GI Bill um, and redlining. Um, you know, I, I, similar to Nicole, I had no idea, um, no idea, um, you know, and I, I, so I found this group. I mean, it's changed me in terms of, I mean, it's been really humbling. Um, it's, it's left me at times dis disillusioned because how, how could all of these things been happening? I, I, really, ha I really had no idea. And, and it, it, it kills me, right? I, I, I um, you know, I'm, I'm very well educated. I have multiple degrees. I've traveled the world. I have people in foreign countries that report to me. I, I have very diverse teams, all, all these sorts of things. And, and this, I didn't know this. And so really like, you know, that's a hard thing to come, come to terms with. And if I don't know this, what else don't I know? Um, and so for me, that, that's the biggest thing. And, and so I'm trying to constantly learn and I'm trying to weave these things into conversations at home. You know, we're in the process of refinancing our house, for example. And as I'm doing this, I'm talking to my kids how easy it is for me to get money, right? And, and then I, you know, see the mortgage, the refi application that asks me to, to say if I'm black or not. And so I follow up with my mortgage person to, to say, you know what, I, I didn't answer that question because 
It has nothing to do with whether I'm not, I, you should give me money. So I find that I'm like a little feisty now, um, but at the same extent, really, really humble, really humble, because I, I had no idea, no idea. Where did you come from? You said you came from a whiter town than this one. I'm trying to picture it. I did. Um, I, I, I came from a shoreline town in Connecticut. Really? You know, Ali um, or Nicole, you both mentioned the GI Bill, and I'm thinking that probably a lot of people who might listen might not know what about the GI Bill, right? Like, what, what is wow. it? And I was going to say it too, but one of you could say, what did you learn about the GI Bill that you were amazed by? Nicole, do you want to take this? Sure. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> please feel free to add or correct if I, I don't get this right. But um, basically after World War II, when, when soldiers came back, there were benefits provided to them or offered to, to them to um, particularly related to, to buying homes. And um, while that was in, in name or officially available to everybody, um, the reality was that while this benefited thousands of white um, soldiers who returned, um, only, I think I was just looking this up again, I think it was only 100 um, non-white soldiers benefited from it. So there was a, a clear um, discrepancy there. And, you know, owning a home, uh, that is, um, that's a major stepping stone for, for building wealth. Um, and, and leads to generational wealth. So the impacts of that, you know, still have an effect today of, of having that, that way to get yourself started, um, you know, when you're, you're rebuilding your life after, you know, major world event, that, that people, the white people were able to do that in a way that um, non-white people um, were, were not able to, or I should say people of color were not able to. Yeah, then there was also uh, GI benefits for education. So when I when I learned this, it was very personal because I realized this had been my personal ticket into the middle class, that my dad had been in the Navy in, during World War II, and he was able to go to college and I think seminary also on GI Bill benefits. Um, and, most, and there were 1.2 million black GIs who came back. And for the most part, they could not get these college benefits because they were quotas, that schools would only take X number of African-American um, students. So, uh, so, you know, so this huge lift up that my family got, uh, which relates to how I got to live in a good neighborhood and have a dad with a professional job and go to college myself, um, you know, black families were not afforded, who had been in exactly the same situation, were not afforded that benefit, which I too found appalling, I have to say. So that's a lot about the GI Bill, but I just didn't want it to go by without us explaining what we meant. Yeah, see, and I, I wouldn't pause because both that and, and then the redlining I lived through. You know, so it was like, that's what I mean about the generation thing. It's, it's, you know, you don't always think that the person you're talking to might actually have memory of that. But, you know, I can remember we were, I think it would have been our second or third, second house where um, redlining was just such a really, really big deal, even out here, you know, even out here. So anyway, um, Dawn, you didn't speak to the, you yeah. know, change yeah, speak to that. Uh, how does this change me? Uh, so there are two things. And one is, um, I would say they sort of come in the category of better understanding and better relationships, right? Um, the better understanding uh, is about things like the GI Bill, or I think I'm much more aware of, of sort of insidious cultural racism. An example I'm fond of is what color is angel food cake and what color is devil's food cake? Um, or when those of us who are Christian have the body and blood of Christ, I mean, the body of Christ, and we go do communion, what color is the body of Christ? It's almost always white bread. <laughs> those little white wafers. And, you know, you think about it, Jesus probably was not so white. Um, not that white, anyway. Um, so there's that kind of stuff is just all over the place. Standards of beauty, standards of, um, of what makes for good art, all that kind of stuff. Um, but then also, and, and, and learning about that while I was raising my kids and going about my business at my job, here's another structural example. The war on drugs was being waged in Black and Latinx communities um, so that huge numbers of, of young uh, Black and, uh, and uh, Latino men mostly um, were getting taken away from their families and imprisoned for having the same, doing the same kinds of behavior that, you know, that the youth in my town were doing who were white, but they were not getting jailed for it. So just that huge disruption and destruction. Um, 
to uh, to fam to black and brown families. Um, so those things were, you know, they're horrifying, and I I I didn't I don't want to not know about them, right? Because <laughs> if I don't know about them, I can't. I can't try to respond to them in any way. So, um, but the other thing is that my relationships get better over time. The more I do this work and introspection and talking about racism, the more warm, relaxed relationships I can have with people of all kinds, really. Um, uh, I think in terms of people of color, it helps to be, you know, uh, willing to talk about one of the biggest factors in their lives. <laughs> you know, if I, if I can't, you know, can't listen about racism or can't say anything about how it affects me. Um, that's a, a big barrier in terms of somebody who's dealing with it every day. So I just really appreciate um, the kind of gradual growth that's let me have a more interesting, better connected, more diverse, less segregated life than I used to have. And um, that's been a, a long process, not just the last three years, but it really has made a huge difference. So that's what I would say about that. Did, did you come from a small town as well? No, I, my earliest years were actually in a very diverse community. When I was very small, I was in East Harlem, which was um, mostly um, at that time, um, Puerto Rican immigrants and black people would come north as part of the great migration. My dad was a minister, so we were a part of a, a church. He was part of a church leadership team there. Um, and then, I, but then when I was six, I moved to a, a more white community, upstate New York. So I had, I've had a sort of varied background that way, Mary. I had I had a similar experience. I was a little bit older when I left the city of Springfield, but I grew up basically in a black neighborhood mm -hmm. where it was, you know, sort of 50-50. Or it's actually there was a, a there were also some Puerto Rican families that were, mm -hmm. were there. Less that that seemed to be more the situation at that point than people coming from Mexico and Central America. And, and yeah, it was that migration away? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But then I then I was sent off to a private girls' school mm -hmm. uh, in Lati La land, you know, and it was like. A culture shock. Wow, what a change, Mary. A oh, yeah. 180 degree change. And um, yeah, so it was, I, I, but I'm grateful as I look back. I think it provided me a whole lot of perspective that I'm grateful that I, I had. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to talk about what you learned, but what are those lessons that you learned that you'd like to be able to get other people to, to know about, to think about? How do they there, right now, anybody who's watching is not going to be able to just sit down and join a group. You know, maybe they'll think of doing their own group. And let's face it, you could do one in a neighborhood. You could do one in a doesn't matter. Do one at a gym. But what what are those one or two lessons that you would want to convey to them? Mary, I'm going to frame it. For you. I think I think basically we are talking to other white people right now, right? Like we have no advice or lessons to be giving to, to, to uh, people of color. So I just wanted to make to, to suggest that that's what we're really saying here what do we want to say to other white people does that make sense to you nicole and ali okay okay what do you want to say to other white people because now's your turn <laughs> so i can go again um so I, I think um you know as we've talked about racism feels huge and help you know hopeless and you may feel helpless in it um but I think change is possible um, and it's not just the responsibility of people of color to address it. So um, we are as white people in a position of privilege in, in you know, different organizations in our life. And so uh, it is um, up to us to, to be part of influencing change. Um, and so where we individually have power, you know, that may be something somewhere different for all of us. So it could be in the hiring practice of your workplace. It could be in schools or police departments or in clubs or organizations or wherever you have that connection. That's where, you know, um, as a white person, you you could uh, be influencing change. Um, it's also when we talk with our, our family and friends who, um, you know, we already have that relationship with and so we can have loving and honest conversations to, to, to all grow together. Um, and, you know, we can examine the causes that we donate to and who they benefit and, you know, of course, who we vote for at all levels, where do they stand in the fight for racial justice. So I think, you know, while it's we can feel hopeless sometimes it, there are things that as individuals without you know super powerful position we all have a place that we can potentially um impact um and i think it's also uh 
not too late to start. So if you've reached this point in life, um, I think as Ali and I have both talked about that um, you, you haven't gone that deep into learning about racism, this is, this is a great time to start because this is a major moment in the US right now. And, and there can be real change that comes from this, but you know, it's not up to our, our black friends and neighbors to teach us. Um, there's no shortage of books and articles and podcasts and movies to learn about racism. And especially right now, there's, you know, plenty of lists out there of, of what, what we can be looking at. And so if we do our homework first, we can um, work out our own feelings in private and, and not burden anybody who has to deal with racism on a daily basis. And, um, you know, as we've talked about in our small anti-racism group there, we're fortunate to have um, a diverse group where we can engage in conversation, conversations that, you know, we span different life experiences, but um, the expectation for white people shouldn't be that, for people of color to educate us or to comfort us. And, um, you know, we also shouldn't expect a pat on the back for participating in this conversation right now. So I think the most important thing is just to keep going that, you know, by reading or watching one thing that, that doesn't tell you the whole story and it's, it's uh, something to continue over, over our lives. It's not a competition to figure out who figures it out. Allie, how about you? Well, I, I definitely um, echo everything Nicole says. Um, to avoid rep repetition, I guess, for me, um, one of the things that, well, I guess one of the things that I've seen more on like the Holliston Facebook groups um, is really an inability of people to consider the other person's point of view. Yeah. Um, that is the nature of social media. Um, I wish there was a way to have a more productive conversation, you know? And so what you're doing, Mary, right? Starting, launching this, this idea of yours with us. Um, I hope we can be the catalyst for more, more conversation. I hope if there's people that are watching um, that they don't know how to have this conversation, that, that they reach out to us as a, as a resource. Um, there's other people in the community, um, obviously, who, who are certainly resources as well. Um, but sometimes it's so daunting, you, you don't know how to start. Um, the other thing that's been really interesting um, for me personally, again, because I have teenage kids, is, you know, kids nowadays get their news and information from different sources than I get mine. Um, and I roll my eyes at my kids, you know, watching BuzzFeed and TikTok and all these sorts of things and thinking it's a source of news. Um, that said, my kids have actually learned a lot of interesting things off these social media platforms. Um, and, you know, even people embedded in riot, like as part of the riots, making TikTok videos and sharing them up. So it's interesting in my household, my kids may know better what's going on than I do. And I thought, huh, that's fascinating. I never would have thought TikTok would be a, a way to actually get some useful um, information. And so I guess with that, I, I, think, I think it's important to have these conversations. Um, clearly, they, I did not have them growing up. Um, they were not at my school growing up, right, these conversations for me to be blindsided in my 40s is, um, you know, it should never happen. And so I think, you know, the, the activism um, of the youth in this community should be commended because they're pushing this discussion. Um, and I think that they're, you know, they're not part of this discussion here today, for example, but I think that they will be part of the continued discussion in the community. Um, and I think that, you know, again, intergenerationally, we can all learn a lot from each other, um, even from, from our youth. I'm going to have to get contact information on that because I think you're right. I think I've got another interview coming. Uh, let's see if I can connect with those guys. I mean, I do, I have kids in my family that I live with. So, I mean, it's, I do have some access to the TikTok world, but um, 
I would like to get the kids that started the the uh, demonstration, the protest demonstration downtown and so forth. I, I remember J.B. Cerulli, he was actually a, um, I was a mentor for him when he was in high school, but uh, interesting. I'll have to get a hold of them. All right, and Don, and how about yourself? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I, I just loved hearing what each of you said, Nicole and Allie. I feel yeah. so lucky to get to listen to you and your journeys. So uh, what I want to say to other people goes something like this. We are good and lovable human beings. Like there is no, it's neither necessary nor helpful to feel bad about ourselves about racism, right? It's easy to, to go in that, that route and, and it, it doesn't actually make sense. Like we did not ask for this. Um, we all, I think, I'm speaking about a little we all there, which is not consistent with our what we try to do. But uh, my understanding is, what I have seen, it seems to be that we all carry racism in our minds and in our behaviors. Um, there's no way we could have avoided this because it's so infused in the culture. Um, Verne Williams has a great TED talk, uh, something about how to deal with our biases, walk straight toward them. And she, she says, we were all outside when the contamination came down. And she's an African heritage woman. Um, so people of color, white people, we all have absorbed these um, really toxic ideas and perspectives. Um, and, and what I wanna say, to other white people is this limits our lives in a huge way. Like racism is bad for us, <laughs> as well as being bad for our Asian and Latin, Latinx and, and black and neighbors and friends and native people. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so, um, so we can work to rid ourselves of racism. And as we do that, we get better equipped to help to work to rid our society of racism. And that this is a really, um, uh, a really satisfying and interesting uh, project to, to, to be working on, to be engaged with, um, and hopeful. It's really hopeful to be engaged in this way. Um, you know, uh, we are not to blame for absorbing the contamination, but we do get to be responsible for clearing it out of ourselves and for figuring out how to um, how to clear it out of our society. We are all going to be so much better off when we remake remake our institutions in such a way that they really support all human beings. That's going to be amazing. So, um, so that's my little pep talk for other white people. This will, uh, this, this, this can make our, our lives so much better as well as our world so much better. Um, it's worth it, I guess is what I'm saying. It's worth the, the discomfort um, because it's really very hopeful and joyful. Um, and I feel so lucky to, you know, to get to do it. So that's, that's my, that's, That's a very positive message. Thank you for that. Thank you. So as, as we're gonna, getting ready to wrap up here, I wanted each of you to go around and just talk about what's the book or the video or the TED talk or the whatever, that inspirational moment that either the light bulb went off or you said, wow, that that's, says it all. What you got? So Don, why don't we start with you? And we'll, go back. well, so this is the book we read first. It's called Waking Up White. It's by, we're gonna, we're gonna be able to post a resource list. It's by uh, Debbie Irving. Um, and you know, it's a really good kind of introductory book. This one woman is basically just talking about her experience of kind of learning that racism is a thing. I mean, she was very protected as a young person, much more than I was and, and quite privileged economically. Um, but what, what she, she's really good at uh, kind of um, in a vulnerable, honest, straightforward way, talking about her journey um, from being really clueless to being um, more and more effectively anti-racist and, and still on the journey, of course. Um, that's the book where I found, we all, I think, found out about the GI Bill, because <laughs> that was a big one for her, too. Um, but she talks about, um, you know, how racism affects her personally and then the structural institutional aspects. Um, so it's a really good kind of waking up to the topic book. Um, and the other thing that I'll mention, again, is that Verne Williams um, TED Talk, which I find very helpful about implicit bias. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll post these, or at least we'll ask Mary and Bruce if they can be posted. Uh, but those are two things that I would, I would mention. What about... You guys. Yeah, what about you guys? Allie, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, you know, where I'm looking for things um, that spur good conversations at home, um, the movie The Hate You Give um, is fantastic. Um, the movie Remember the Titans, fantastic. Um, and those are really good both as the movie, but there's so many things to talk through. Um, so I, anybody um, with kids, I wanted to recommend those. Um, for me, um, if you Google the Ford Foundation, they have a bunch of videos available online. 
Um, they have a bunch of really short videos that explain um, their most teasers for bigger, video, longer videos. And I'd say if you want to learn something, right, if you want to learn about redlining, um, this sort of thing, that's a really good, um, the Ford Foundation is a really good, good resource. Um, and then there's obviously a whole bunch of, of TED Talks um, or little online YouTube videos. But for me, things that are really impactful are all these things that cause you to check your privilege. Like, I, I, I don't know that I've seen them um, recently, but maybe last year there was a bunch of them where, you know, everybody starts on the same line and you oh, answer yes. these questions, right? And yeah. if, if this happens to you, you get to move forward. And if this yeah. happens to you, you get to move back. Um, those sort of things I think are really yeah. beneficial for white people to think through because so often, I mean, so I, so often I can just move forward without ever thinking, how did I get there? Yep. And um, so it helps with the introspection part. Nicole? Unfortunately, I think there are some people who think that they got to move forward purely because they of everything they did that it was all up to them there was it, it, there was no other factor except their hard work or whatever and i don't think there's anybody alive that can say that because we've all had parents or neighbors or friends or somebody that that carried us somewhere you know so no I, absolutely you know i'm a hard worker you're a hard worker yeah. right so everybody's a hard worker let's just put that out there right it's not like I got farther than someone else because I'm a hard work, you know, harder worker. Right. No. And it's not but, supposed to be a competition. No. At any no. rate. Okay, yeah. Nicole, come on. Right. What's your favorite? <laughs> um, well, so as a parent, I've been reading um, Raising White Kids in a Racially yeah. Unjust America um, by Dr. Jennifer Harvey. Um, so that helps me to think and kind of mentally prepare myself for the situations that are they're inevitably going to come up, you know, a small child who's observing the world around her so that I can be prepared to handle those situations in a, a loving and productive age appropriate way. Um, so so I, I think that's a helpful one. Um, and then, uh, of course, it's also important to read, listen, and, and watch things that are created by Black people. Um, and, you know, so uh, the documentary 13th, uh, directed by Ava DuVernay is very powerful for understanding the intersection of race and mass incarceration. Um, and so it's definitely something that, that I've learned from, um, from watching that documentary. There are a lot of opportunities to learn if you're, if you're willing. So we will post um, whatever list of resources you have and we will attach it to the end of this video. Um, and obviously this will all be available on online in very short order. So ladies, thank you very much for being willing to do this. Um, it, it, ha it is hard to find people who are willing to go on in front of a camera and talk about race. Um, only too happy to do it through anonymity or through some, you know, backdoor uh, social media. But at any rate, um, when offered the opportunity, they're kind of like, well, no, I don't think I can do that, you know. But at any rate, so thank you. And I've learned a lot, and I've enjoyed listening to you, to listen to the, the journey you've been on. You've obviously been moved by it, and that has moved me. So thank you very, very much. Mary, I just want to appreciate your persistence in... Um and you know, pursuing this kind of show on this kind of topic, because that also takes courage. And uh, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And we'll, uh, we'll keep in touch. I'll be back to you, I am sure. So with that, I'm going to say good night to everybody, or goodbye, because it's still daytime. But at any rate, thank you. And thank you to the audience. And we'll catch you next time when we're just thinking. <laughs> <laughs>